Welcome to African Roots, brought to you by DW. In this podcast series, we discover how individuals from across Africa shape the continent. I'm Leila Johnson Salami. And I'm Kai Nebe. Today's African Roots is quite a special one, right, Leila? Yes, I, I must say, Kai, I'm super, super stoked for this one. Yeah, and for listeners, today's episode of African Roots, we're looking at how two spiritual mediums changed their regions forever and how one actually rewrote the rules of Christianity. So there's no better person to start this podcast with than Kimpa Vita, Leila. I must say, Kai, I mean, I've heard about Kimpa Vita, but... I don't really know that much about her. <laughs> well, neither had I until I came across this really remarkable historical episode that played out in what is now the coastal and hinterland areas of northern Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we're in the Congo Kingdom in about 1680. The Congo Kingdom, so not the Congo as we know it today, I'm guessing. Around 200 years earlier, in fact, uh, Portuguese explorers and traders have made inroads around the mighty Congo River and found the strongest and wealthiest power in Central Africa, the Congo Kingdom. The Portuguese introduce uh, Roman Catholicism and they start by converting local leaders and kings. This was at a stage where trade and actually winning souls for the Catholic Church was quite an important thing. Leaders of the Congo around the time took names like Jao, Afonso, Antonio, while retaining their own names that they'd been given. So I'm getting the idea here, Kai, that the region became fundamentally Christian then, we can say. Well, yes and no. There were, there were plenty of clashes between local beliefs and Catholicism. One of the major sticking points, of course, was that the Catholic Church required monogamy. And in many local religions, polygamy was, was common. But also, the Portuguese started disrupting life in the kingdom. They started looking at ways to sow divisions among the local people. And of course, with the Portuguese, um, there was a huge increase in the slave trade. And while slaves had been traded around locally, when the Portuguese arrived, the slave trade really increased. So at this stage, Catholicism was alive and well in the Congo. When a girl was born in 1684, who would go on to be known as Kimpa Vita. 1684. So... How did Kimpavita start out life? Well, she was of noble birth, she was educated in the Catholic religion, but she was also trained as an Nganga Marinda, which is a traditional healer, if you will. Uh, think of her as a medium between the living and the ancestors, and an interpreter of good and evil. Hmm, so kind of like a priestess then. Yeah, there you go. But when she was about 16, she fell seriously ill. And we don't really know what her diagnosis was. We don't know what the cause was. But it was very bad. She was actually expected to die. But Kimpa Vita somehow recovered. And some have attributed this to a miracle. Kimpa Vita herself claimed that she had gone to heaven and returned as the reincarnation of St. Anthony of Padua. Okay, I'm just going to act like I know who St. Anthony of Padua is. <laughs> well, St. Anthony of Padua was a, a saint in the Catholic religion. And uh, were people inclined to believe her? That's up for interpretation. But according to Angolan historian Alberto Oliveira, local power struggles at the time left many parts of the kingdom in ruins. And the fact that here comes somebody who who has a who claims to have religious power actually gave a lot of people hope and drew them to Kimpavita's cause a grande importância da jovem Beatriz Kimpavita the great importance of young Beatrice Kempavita is that she could bring the people of Congo together after three decades, almost four decades, of intense war. Hmm. And what war was this? You see, in the 17th century, the Kingdom of the Congo was in decline. The kingdom had suffered after the Battle of Mbuila in 1665, where the Portuguese had killed King Antonio I. The kingdom's capital, called Mbanza Congo, was abandoned and lay in ruins. And there were also divisions among the nobles who actually wanted to succeed Antonio I. Divided then. Yes, but along comes Kimpa Vita, who had become really a symbol of a new religion in the Congo. And crucially, 
a mix between local beliefs and Christianity. Kimpa Vita foi a verdadeira fundadora da religião. Kimpa Vita was a true founder of the Bakongo national religion. She was already a priestess of the Marinda cult, who are the healers of evil, before receiving the message of her ancestors through Saint Anthony of Padua to unify the kingdom of Congo, which was suffering from internal divisions since the Battle of Imbila in 1665. That's Ricardo Vita, an Angolan observer and a critic of Pan-African history. So she took Catholicism and kind of made it accessible, can I say, for local people? Yes, in a way. But importantly, she actually also legitimized Christianity before. After imagine Christianity was seen as something from the white people or something that had been brought in. Now, she was known as Dona Beatriz Kimpavita and she wanted an Afro-centered in reinterpretation of Catholicism. In her visions, she said that Jesus was black and he was born in Banza, Congo. And she also created new versions of prayer. Here's Ricardo Vita again. Africanized Christianity existed before Kimpa Vita in the Kingdom of Congo. For example, there are cave paintings dating from the time of Don Afonso I that show a black Christ. So when Kimpa Vita revealed that she saw a black Saint Anthony of Padua, it only startled the missionaries and the white people, not the Bakongo. On the contrary, it helped to give credit to her mission, which she led with diligence in less than two years because it promised a collective salvation. Well, Kimpavita's brand of Christianity becomes known as Antonianism. She gains a large following, sets about reviving the abandoned capital of Mbanza, Congo. She even attracts local noble interest from a guy called Pedro Constantino da Silva, who also was known as Kibenga. Remember, Kimpavita has presented herself as a medium who can travel between heaven and earth. And that's, for a lot of people at the time, I think quite an amazing feat. But hold on a second. I mean, this must have also been good news for the Portuguese, right? I mean, she was winning souls for the church, no? Initially, yes. And you're right. She was, in fact, theoretically winning souls for Catholicism. But you see, this, this, this optimism stopped when the Portuguese saw that the of the power she actually had over the people. And this is actually, at this point in time, this is where the lines between history, legend, oral tradition, and myth actually all get a little bit blurry. Hmm, how blurry are we talking? Pretty blurry, but, but, but hear me out. At the time, a group of Portuguese Capuchin monks, aware of the power struggles and the clout that Kimpavita had, presumably created a rumor here. And what's the rumor? Well, the rumor was that in order to be king, one had to have a bag blessed by the Pope, i.e. the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church. But the problem was that this bag is lost, and so therefore nobody has a claim to it. Alberto Oliveira Pinto explains what happened next. Beatriz Kimbavita costumava dizer aos seus acólitos Beatrice Kempavita tells her acolytes she is once again going to heaven, but now for a while to retrieve this bag, because she says and makes sure she has the bag with her. Actually, Beatrice Kempavita had become pregnant by one of her guardians who was an ordinary man, and it was to give birth to a child that she was gone for more than two or three days. Uh, e foi para dar à luz uma criança que ela se afastou por mais do que dois ou três dias. So, by conceiving a child by a normal man, Kim Pavita lost her status as a spiritual medium. Kind of. And this also played into the hands of the Portuguese, who actually wanted to discredit her. The Congolese leader at the time, Dom Pedro IV, whose position was particularly threatened by Kim Pavita's association with our guy Pedro Constantino da Silva, sent his troops after her. Legend has it that the troops found Kimpavita breastfeeding her baby. She was captured, held in captivity, and in 1706, the Capuchin monks sent her to be burned alive for being a witch and a heretic. Wow. Kai, that's that's dark. (laughs) 
Well, at the time, executing women accused of witchcraft unfortunately was not uncommon at the time, in Europe in particular. According to the monks, the child was spared, but the written records we do have are mainly from Friar Bernardo de Gallo, the very man who actually sentenced Kimpavita to death. You know, it's hard to know what to make of Kimpavita. I mean, she seems to have tapped into a belief system that really galvanized a divided people. Well, exactly. It galvanized them enough to become a threat to the Portuguese and their interests. But I think that her legacy lives on in many African countries, not just, the, uh, not just Angola and, the, and today's Democratic Republic of the Congo, but actually in the field of religion with syncretic churches. Syncretic churches, by the way, are those that mix traditional um, African beliefs as well as Christian beliefs. On another level, in the Congo and Angola, Kimba Vita has really become a symbol of unity and self-determination. Unity and self-determination, Kai. Uh, I've got more on this for you when we come back. Any more Catholic saints in mind here? Mm, not quite, but we will find out how a snake, a man, and magic water created a nightmare for Germany's colonial ambitions. DW, African Roots. Find new African Roots episodes on dw.com slash African Roots, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to African Roots. Leila, I hope you've recovered from that grueling tale of Kimpa Vita. Oh, that's a tough one, Kai, I must say. But the theme of mediums comes up a lot in my story, too. Um, it concerns... Someone I would say or describe as an ordinary man in modern day, in modern day Tanzania uh, who rallied people to rise up against the German colonizers. And he did this by promising them protection and not just normal protection or protection in a way that you may think of it. He did this by promising them protection with water medicine, a promise that he ultimately couldn't keep, Kai. Go on. So it's the late 19th century. Germany invades Tanzania, then known as Tanganyika, and forces locals to work on the German cotton plantations and other cash crops. Now, Kai, this is back-breaking work, and you know the colonial overseers whip the laborers, right? So conditions are terrible, unimaginable. But not only that, the colonizers also impose heavy taxes, and by 1904, Tanganyikans are desperate, right? because the subjugation means that they can't plant crops to feed themselves. Well, this is sounding pretty, pretty bad here. Mm, yeah, but amidst this despair, a prophet emerges. A long time ago, a man disappeared into a lake and stayed underwater for 24 hours. When he emerged, his clothes were dry. In his hands, he carried water that he said was magic and would turn bullets into liquid. The man's name was Kinjeketile Ngwale. So Kinjeketile is the prophet you're talking about? Mm-hmm. He claimed to have been possessed, right, by a spirit known as Hongo. He said that the spirit appeared to him in a snake form, and Kinjakatile said that the deity had given him Maji. Now, this was a potion made of millet and plain water, which would nullify the Germans' advantage. Okay, okay, Leila, just back up a bit here for a second. So, I'm just trying to get into the mind of people at the time, but if you've seen that these people, if you've seen that these invaders have taken over, you know, with their weapons and whatever, um, why would anyone actually believe Kinjeketile with this potion of his? <laughs> Honestly, Kai, I, I do wonder the same thing. But, you know, it's a hard thing to speculate. Imagine you suddenly find yourself oppressed by a small fighting force of men that sweat profusely and die of fever, but have vastly, vastly superior weapons. I mean, it was machine guns and rifles, pretty much versus spears. And then suddenly comes along uh, saying that he can render the enemy's weapons useless? Mm, you know, you could believe him. And crucially... Kinja Katile's prophesying united a vast array of different ethnic groups, and this was done to fight the Germans. Now, according to Professor Bertram Mapunda from Tanzania's University of Dar es Salaam. Wakati wanaanza vuguvugu hizo za vita, 
When the preparations for the rebellion picked up speed, the Germans had already had a word of strange goings on that involved traditional healers handing out a special brew to the people. When asked, the healers lied to them, saying it was to keep wild animals like pigs away from their fields. Unfortunately, you know, Kai, the, the German colonists, they, they feared Kinjakatile's influence and they hung him in August 1905. But the damage had been done and the Maji Maji rebellion erupted, Kai. And were people using this magic Maji water? They sure were, but it couldn't save the warriors from German weapons, you know. Crucially, it came down to that. And the war went on for about two more years. And scholars like Prof Mapunda believe that Kinjakatile was instrumental. Had he not provided them with that faith, they wouldn't have fought. And hadn't they fought why, we wouldn't talk about the Maji Maji War today, which is among the most important African wars against colonialism. I'm just imagining, though, that this war essentially pitting colonial forces against warriors must have been extremely deadly. Oh yeah, it was very deadly. I mean, about 180,000 to 300,000 people died as a result of war and a famine that was largely caused by Germany's scorched earth tactics. That's just the truth. And that's about a third of the population at the time. But to put this into even more perspective, Kai, only 15 German soldiers died. <laughs> There are those who think that he lied to the people, but we have to understand that when you give someone the psychological ability, when you build their faith, they fight with vigor. In my opinion, Kinjaketile was a hero. I guess all credit to those people who, despite those overwhelming odds, actually stood up to fight for their land. German rule did reportedly become more lenient after the Maji Maji rebellion. But Leila, in hindsight, has uh, Kinjekatila actually ever been criticized for the deaths that resulted after his false prophecy? I mean, even though many, many people may have believed him and participated, at the end of the day, a lot of people died because they believed in this false prophecy, as it were. I mean, it really is up for debate, Kai, his legacy and whether he did manage to unite Tanzanians against the Germans. But leaders like Julius Nyerere, the first president of independent Tanzania, believed that the Maji Maji revolt started his country's fight for liberation, which, by the way, it did finally achieve in 1961. And hearing your story and also thinking a bit about Kimpa Vita, I'm just, I'm just thinking that these stories make you really wonder about the power of religious fervor and what the power of belief is when you're faced with such incredible repression. Absolutely, you know, but not just that. It was also their ability to tap into local belief systems that made them legitimate threats to their oppressors. That's where we will have to leave things for today. African Roots is a cooperation between Deutsche Welle and the Gerd Henkel Foundation. Special thanks to our producers, Thomas Schmidt, Maya Brown, Philip Zantner, and our voiceover artists. Contributions by Carla Fernandez, James Muhando, and Hawa Behoga. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson-Salami. We'll be back next time.